him right now. Let's give him a hearty amen as Brother Dwight Thompson comes to preach for us tonight. Thank you, Preacher Dan. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Open your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 19, if you would, please. It's always a blessing to be here uh, in your church. We love your pastor and his family, and we're thankful for what God uh, is doing here, has done, and we uh, anticipate what God's going to do in the future as well. In 2 Kings chapter 19 uh, will be our text tonight. I'm going to talk with you for a few moments about about uh, finding hope in a crisis. You know, difficulties and trials are part of living in a world that is cursed by sin. And sometimes our problems can be elevated, though, to a place that we could ra- really call them a crisis. Crisis can be defined as a, as a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. And so tonight, as we look at this situation in 2 Kings chapter 19, we're looking at something that was a true crisis. The nation of Judah has been attacked uh, and invaded by the nation of Assyria. King Hezekiah is the, is the king of Judah, and King Hezekiah and his people have retreated into the city of Jerusalem. I'm going to give you some background before we read the text. They have retreated into the city of Jerusalem, and there they are under siege. The situation for the people of God there in Judah is humanly impossible. There is no way, humanly speaking, that they are going to be able to withstand against the attack of the Assyrian armies. It's impossible. There was no hope. And yet they found hope in the midst of this crisis. Perhaps tonight you might find yourself in a situation where you also feel the same way. You might say, I feel like I'm in a crisis and, uh, and I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. I've got problems that are insurmountable. I don't know what I'm going to do. But tonight, maybe God can give us some hope as we look at these, uh, these situations. Look, if you would, please, in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. It came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes, and he covered himself with sackcloth. He went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble. And of rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be that the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God, will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. And so Hezekiah sends a message to Isaiah the prophet, saying, We have no hope. This is a bad day for us. Uh, we, we, don't know how, we don't know how we're going to survive this. Would you pray for us? In verse 5, so the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah sends back a message of hope. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him. He shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land. I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Father, bless this time together. Thank you again for the opportunity to be back at Heritage Baptist Church. Thank you for Pastor and Mrs. Fong and for the staff here, the people, their family. And Lord, all that you've done through the years here in this great church. We ask, Father, that as they uh, continue to go forward, Father, for your honor and glory, that you might continue to bless. I pray you'd meet with us tonight. May we go away from this place knowing that we have met with thee, having received what we need from from the Word of God. Bless us together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And there's no hope. And yet they found hope. They were in a crisis, but they found this hope in the midst of the crisis. We've all been in those situations, haven't we? As I said earlier, perhaps you found yourself in one now where you feel as if that you don't know what what to do. Uh, Perhaps today you're facing a crisis. I think, I think that as a nation, many people of it, many of us would say that as a nation, we are facing a crisis right now in America. Many people are wondering if there's any hope left for America. Will we be able to survive the political, the cultural, and the, and the uh, moral attacks of the day? But my friend, I want you to understand tonight that, we're this, or tonight that with God, there's always hope. Our God is the God of hope. He's not the God of hopelessness. The word hope is found 130 times in 121 verses of our Bible. Hope 
as we use it today in our, in our vernacular, it's commonly used as a word which simply means uh, uh, like a wish. I wish this would happen. I hope this will happen. I don't really think it's going to happen, but it would be great if it did, but, you know, it's probably not going to happen. Well, when the Bible uses the word hope, that's not what it's talking about. The Bible doesn't mean a wish when it uses the word hope. That 130 times whenever the Bible uses the word hope and God speaks of it in his word, he's not talking about this, uh, oh, wouldn't it be great if Santa Claus were to come today and bring us all kinds of stuff and this would just be wonderful. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a confidence that we have, an expectation that what God has promised in his word, he is able to perform and will do what he said he was going to do in his word. God's promises are the hope in which we put our, put, place our, our, our faith. It's his power. It's his faithfulness that we're counting on. Not, not this pie in the sky thing of wouldn't it be great if this happened. No, no. We're talking about the promises of God where we put our faith in the promises of God. And I believe there's some lessons this morning or, that are tonight that we can find in this story that are going to help us. Uh, in order to get to those lessons, though, I'm going to give you just three lessons we can apply to our own life uh, and that will help us in our time of crisis. But before we do, I need to kind of take a few minutes and give you the backstory. I need to give you a brief history lesson so, you, so we understand exactly how we come to be where we are in this situation. Now, don't get nervous. You may be thinking about 10, 15 minutes into the message, when's he going to get to those thoughts for us that are helpless? We're going to be here all night. We're not going to be here all night. I'm going to have a long introduction and a short message, okay? But it'll be the normal amount of time. And so stay with me. Don't get nervous. The nation of Israel, the nation of Israel, here's the backstory. They have existed for over a thousand years without a king. The nation of Israel had been around for a thousand years or more, and they had had no king. But they were designed to be ruled by God. God never intended that Israel would be ruled by a king. God was to be the king, and then the nation would be led by the prophets and the judges that God raised up from the people. But the people of Israel decided that they didn't want to be like God intended them to be. They wanted to be like everybody else. And you remember the story when they come to Samuel, and they said to Samuel, uh, make us a king. We want to be like everybody else. And you remember Samuel got upset about it, and Samuel was saying, you know, you're, you're, we're not supposed to have a king. We already have a king. God is our king. We have prophets. We have judges. We have the rulers here on this earth. But God is our king. But they said, no, we want to be like everybody else. And so uh, Samuel gets upset about it. But God says to Samuel, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Go ahead and let them have a king. And so they have a king. Now, the first king was a man by the name of Saul. The nation of Israel is going to have three kings where they're united. Only three. They're going to have Saul and their united kingdom, one kingdom uh, of Israel, one, one king, Saul. After Saul, you remember, of course, was David man after God's own heart. And David was the one that brought them to their great, uh, their great power and their great might in the, uh, in, in his, during his 40-year his reign. So you've got Saul, they're united. You've got David, the kingdom's still united. And then after David passes away, his son Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, writer of the book of Proverbs, etc., that man Solomon becomes the king. The nation of Israel is still one kingdom, and they're united under Solomon. Solomon... Uh, lives his life. He reigns for, I think, 40 years, and then he passes away. Then Solomon's son, the fourth king now, is a man by the name of Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam becomes king. He's a young man. He's Solomon's son. But Solomon was a great king, and they became extremely wealthy under, under Solomon. You remember the Bible talks about the silver and the gold and how the silver was like stones. I mean, it was just, they, they, they were extremely wealthy. But Solomon was a good king, but Solomon was, uh, he kind of he ruled with, a, with an iron fist. Solomon had a lot of, of rules and regulations and taxes. And, um, and, he, and he ruled the people. I mean, he'd take the people and move them from place to place. He, he, he ruled pretty hard. He, was, uh, he, he ruled with an iron fist. And so after Solomon dies, Rehoboam, fourth king, still got a united kingdom, one, one kingdom, Israel. So Rehoboam becomes king. And the, a lot of the people were upset. They wanted, they wanted, uh, they said, look, we, we need to ease up on us. Uh, get rid of some of these mandates. You know, let us um, lower the taxes. Uh, we're tired of paying a dollar fifty 
a gallon more for gas than anybody else in America, you know, or, or in Israel, whatever it was. You know. They said, uh, could you lower the taxes? Could you, could you ease up a little bit? Could you let the, let the churches go back and you know, have services again? I mean, whatever, whatever it was. They, the people got together, and they had a, a spokesperson by the name of Jeroboam. So Jeroboam comes to Rehoboam, and he, and he begins to lay out these requests. And, uh, you know, the people, the people would have followed Rehoboam if he would have just listened to what they were asking. If he, if he just had the humility and the wisdom and the understanding to realize that, that these people will follow you, but, but you need to ease up a little bit on what you're doing. You don't, you don't need to be such a dictator as you are. And so Rehoboam foolishly refused. And Rehoboam said, basically, he said, look, you think my dad was bad? You, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. You, you, you're going to find out what it means to really be, really be rough on you. And so Jeroboam, the man who came to talk to Rehoboam on behalf of the people, Jeroboam then pulls out 10 kingdoms out of the 12 kingdoms. He pulls out this group of people, and they form their own kingdom. It's a new kingdom. They set up a new capital, no longer Jerusalem. Now they set up a capital in Samaria, and it's called the kingdom of Israel. That kingdom becomes known as the kingdom of Israel in the north, and they have, the, uh, they have their capital in Samaria. And then the original kingdom becomes the kingdom of Judah, which is in the south, and the capital remains at Jerusalem. And so that's why when you read through your Old Testament a lot of times, you, you'll be saying, they'll be talking about Judah, Israel, Samaria, Jerusalem, and you're thinking, where's the kingdom? <laughs> Where, where's the capital? You know, it, well, it, it's, it's both places. The kingdom of Israel, those 10, that, 10 tribes that withdrew, uh, they, they're in Samaria. The, the original kingdom of, of Ju- now called the kingdom of Judah, is in Jerusalem. Now, but, so that's what happens. And that's when we come to this. Now, there's a problem, though. The problem for Jer- Jeroboam was this. He pulls the 10 tribes out. They've got their new kingdom. Samaria is their capital. But there's a problem. And that is Jeroboam's realizing that you have to go back to Jerusalem in order to worship. And so the, all of the worship is at Jerusalem. And you remember three times a, three times a year, the, the, the Jews are coming, the male Jews are coming back up to Jerusalem and they're going back to Jerusalem to offer the sacrifices to God, to worship Jehovah. And so Jeroboam realizes that, you know, if they keep going back to, to Jerusalem, eventually I'm liable to get killed because they'll, they'll go back to Rehoboam and then I'm going to be tried for treason and I'm dead. So here's what Jeroboam did. Let me just read it for you. It's, in, it's found in 1 Kings chapter 12. I'll just read it for you. Here's what it says. Jeroboam said in his heart, If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of the people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me. Whereupon the king, Jeroboam, made two calves of gold. This is right out of Egypt. That's what they were worshiping in Egypt. He made two calves of gold. And he said unto them, It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. He set one of those golden calves in Bethel. He put the other in Dan. And this thing, this thing became a sin, the Bible says. As a result of idolatry, this is when idolatry is officially introduced to the people of Israel. Jeroboam sets up these two golden calves and says, look, don't be going back to Jerusalem. Let's have our own worship, and it's going to be different, but it's going to be better. And so he sets up his own idolatrous worship. As a result of idolatry, eventually both Israel in the north and Judah in the south are going to be taken into captivity. God is not, God's going to bring judgment upon their idolatry, but what I want you to understand tonight is that Israel is going to fall 136 years before Judah in the south is going to fall. And the difference is this. <clears throat> Judah had some kings, by and large, that were godly men. And those kings were trying to bring the people back to God. Israel had no good kings. I mean, it starts from Jeroboam, and it's bad all the way through. And as a result of their idolatry, God allows the Assyrians, who are now coming to Judah, to, to capture uh, the Israelites there in Samaria. But 136 years, Judah continues on after Israel falls. 
After the northern kingdom falls to Assyria, Judah, the southern kingdom, goes on for another 136 years. Why? Because they had some godly men and they had some godly people who were, even though they had all kinds of idolatry and problems there as well, they, they were, had people that were trying to bring them back to God. And I would say to you tonight, that's what America needs, don't we? We need godly people. We need revival among God's people. It has to start in the church house, not the White House, but it, but it can continue on there. We, we, number one, we need revival among God's people. Secondly, we need a return to leadership that recognizes our Christian heritage and tries to, uh, to, to encourage it not to destroy that heritage. But what I want to talk to you about tonight, though, is our personal crisis. Uh, the time we come to in our text, we're almost there. When by the time we come to our text, the people of Israel have been defeated. They're gone. They've been taken into captivity by the Assyrian nation. Now the Assyrian nation is coming for Judah. They already got Israel. Now they're coming for the southern kingdom. And humanly speaking, there is, there is no hope. But God steps in. And I would say to you tonight, we have every reason in America to have hope for our country as well. We might look around tonight and say, you know, it's just, it, man, it's too far gone. We're, they're, they're, it's, it's just too, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. It, there, was no hope for, there was no hope for Judah, and yet God stepped in. And it wasn't Judah, it wasn't the people of Judah, it wasn't the people of, of uh, uh, Hezekiah's people that were able to save their nation, it was God. God stepped in and did what they could not do in their crisis. And that's what God does. God steps into your crisis and he does for you what you cannot do on your own. It's a crisis. You can't fix it. But God is able to do all things. Now look at 2 Kings chapter 19 and we'll see verse 32 very quickly how God steps in. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. Verse 32. He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. He shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. I will defend the city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Came to pass that night. I love this story. The angel of the Lord went out. He smote in the cap of the Syrians a hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. We'd say today 185,000. The angel of the Lord came and he smote 185,000 of those Assyrian soldiers. And when those Assyrian soldiers woke up the next day, you know what they were? They were dead. That's what the Bible says. I believe the Bible. He says, he said, I love the way he put it. When they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead. <laughs> it wasn't the dead guys who were rising. It was the other people and the other people were dead. But I love the way it's worded. So when the other soldiers woke up, there were 185,000 dead fellow soldiers there laying there. And as a result, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed. He went and goes back to his own place at Nineveh. And there, two of his own sons took his own, took his own life. Now, God steps in. What are some lessons for us tonight? Judah's in a crisis. They cannot fix it. But God steps in and does what they cannot do. Tonight, you might be, and if you're not in one tonight, by the way, you, you will be at one at some point. Right? My wife and I have been married for almost 50 years. This coming January 29th will be 50 years. We've been married for 49 and a half years. You know what we've seen? We've seen problems in 49 and a half years. We've seen crisis. We've seen problems that were, you know, look, Job said, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. You don't get through life without problems. And sometimes those problems are elevated to the point where they're not just a problem, they're a crisis. That's part of living in this world. We're going to have problems. When those problems are elevated to that point of crisis, here's some lessons that we can do in our own life. If you'll take these and, and think of these, remember these, and apply them in when it comes to your life. Number one, notice if you would please, what are the lessons for us? Number one, we need to learn not to take every crisis personally. Now, Hezekiah is in a crisis, but Hezekiah was not the real target. It looked like he was, but he really wasn't. Look, if you would please, at verse 6. The Bible says in verse 6, Isaiah said unto them, 
Thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. They're blaspheming Hezekiah, but, but God says, Isaiah, remind Hezekiah, this is not about you. This is bigger than you. Drop down, if you please, verse 22. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? Against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lift up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? Verse 28, thy rage against me. Thy rage against me. Uh, when a crisis comes into your life, could I, could, I, could, I, could I say this to you? Don't blame God. You know, when, when problems come, when crisis comes, we're always looking for somebody to blame. Don't blame God. Look, just because God allowed a crisis to come into your life does not mean he caused the crisis. They happen sometimes. They come into our lives. God didn't send every problem that you've got in your life. We're living in a fallen world, a place where people act contrary to the will of God. Jesus warned us that in this fallen world, in the world which we live in that is cursed by sin, you're going to have problems. Things are going to happen. Jesus said, these things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace, John 16, in the world you shall have tribulation. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. The New Testament writers echoed the same thing that Jesus said. First Peter 4, 12, for example, Peter said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Um, do, you know, we, we have a problem and we think, what's going on? I mean, I, I love God. I have my devotions. I tithe. I go to church. Why am I having problems? It's you're living in a sin-cursed world. The fact that we're walking with Jesus doesn't mean we're not going to have any problems. Bad things happen in life. As I said, we automatically want somebody to blame. Sometimes there's nobody to blame. We're just looking for somebody to blame. It's not your fault. It's not your kid's fault. It's not your pastor's fault. It's not God's fault. It's part of living in this world. But we, but we want somebody to blame. It's got to be somebody's fault that I've got this problem. I mean, Hezekiah, Hezekiah could have been, been there in the temple crying out to God saying, God, why, why did you let me? Why me, God? I'm a good king. I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to bring these people back to you. And now you, let the, you, send, you send these people to, to, to kill us, to take us into captivity? He didn't do that. He's not crying out and blaming God. He's not looking around blaming his staff. He's not blaming somebody else. Bad things happen in life. Does anybody here remember 2020? Anybody remember that year? I'm 71 years old. I remember it. Out of 71 years, that's, that's the one year I can't forget. How many of you wish you could forget 2020, right? 2020 was a very unusual year. <laughs> very interesting year. In 2020... It was a year I can't forget. In 2019, my wife and I were living in China. We're basing our ministry out of there and going into other countries from there. We support 88 different national pastors in 19 different countries. So not all of them are in China. In fact, most of them are not. They're, they're all over that, that part of the world. And so we were, we were traveling to other countries, but we were living there because we like it there. And uh, we don't like the government, but, uh, and I can say that now. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like the government. In fact, just before we had to leave in 2019, we were walking down the street one day, and I, and I said to my wife, I said, sweetheart, I said, you know, living in China is like living in the, in the largest prison in the world. And she said, yeah. We're walking along. We're looking. There's a camera there. There's a camera there. There's one right outside our door. We lived on the 25th floor. We step outside of our apartment. We, we, we step outside of our apartment. There's a camera right there. We walk around to the elevator. There's a camera right there. We step into the elevator. There's a camera right there in the elevator. So what I'd do every morning, I'd step into the elevator. I'd give my wife a big smooch. <laughs> Smile at the camera. Just so they got something to laugh about. You know, look at these two guilos, you know, out here, you know, <laughs> kissing in the elevator, you know. And so we go down, and the, we get off the elevator on the first floor. <clears throat> there's a camera right there. We step outside. There's another one. We'd walk down the street. There's another one. We'd turn the corner. There's another one. They're everywhere, everywhere. So we're walking down the street. I said to my sweetheart, I said, you know, it's like living in the largest prison in the world. She said, yeah, kind of. 
And I said, but at least it's a nice prison. <laughs> got Starbucks on the corner. Got McDonald's. <laughs> got a great transportation system. You know, it's inexpensive. And, uh, but it's like, it's like living in prison in some ways. 2019, we had to leave. Everything you've heard about the crackdown in February 2019 is true. It, it all happened. It all happened. I mean, the church is being closed, people disappearing off the streets. It, it all happened. Many, many people had to leave. So through no fault of our own 2019, we left. We actually left in December of 2019, just before, just before the, the final. By January, you had to be gone. We left in December. <clears throat> we came back to the States. Now, when we got back to the States, our 2020 schedule was packed with meetings, multiple countries. As well, we had some meetings in the United States. We had some in, in of course, the Philippines and in China and in uh, Laos and uh, all, across, uh, all across the area, Hong Kong, uh, even in, uh, in the Ukraine and the Bible College there. We had, we had meetings all, all, all around the world. We had them here in the States. We had them in Canada. And uh, our 2020 schedule was, was, was packed. Every week we were going to be somewhere. So we had to come back to the States. And uh, we decided that we would base our ministry in, in Florida. So on March 6th, we bought a townhome in, in uh, Pensacola, Florida. Now, <clears throat> we prepared to be in Florida for a total of 10 days because on March 16th, I'm sure we were both going to be in the Philippines. On March 16th, so we had 10 days. We buy this townhome on March 10th. We've already got the tickets for the Philippines and all the rest of it, you know, the, everything, just as you did, Pastor. And so, so in 10 days, we've got, we're going to be gone. Buy our ticket. We, we buy this little house. March 11th. The World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. March 13th, President Trump declared a national emergency. March 16th, all those flights were canceled. Not only to the Philippines, they were canceled to China. They were canceled to the Ukraine. They were canceled. All, any, any foreign travel was canceled. March 19th, California issued a stay-at-home order. <coughs> all of a sudden... My meetings in America began to be canceled. Soon they were canceled in Canada as well. March 24th, I turned 70 years old. That was a sad, sad day as well. <laughs> March through September. Now this is 2020. You remember it. <laughs> March through September, we are stranded. I mean, we can't get out of town. <laughs> you couldn't either. We're, we're, we're stuck. March through September, we're stuck. September 6th, my wife and I, Gail and I, both tested positive for COVID. September 18th, Hurricane Sally decided to hit Pensacola. We were watching the news. Everything on the news said that that hurricane was going to go to the west of us. It was going to end up in Louisiana. Everything's going to be okay. We're staying in our house. Where else are we going to go? We don't know anybody in Florida. We knew, we, we knew a few people by that time, but hardly anybody. We didn't really have anywhere, anywhere else to go. We're staying in our home. No problem. Our neighbors are going, to, are going to as well. That hurricane started to turn. And it looked at Pensacola. And it looked at our house. And we had met the city manager of Gulf Breeze, which is the little town right outside of Pensacola that we live in. And so we had met the, the city manager at, at, at church, and we had become somewhat friends. And so uh, she actually called the pastor and, and, and told the pastor, you need to call Pastor Tomlinson, and you need to tell the Tomlinsons, get out of your house. This was September 17th. I think it's a Monday night. I think Tuesday was September 18th. And she calls, and so pastor calls me on the phone. Brother Jeff calls me on the phone, and he said, preacher, you've got to get out of town. I just got off the phone with the city manager, and uh, she, or she, he said, you got to get out of your house. She said, your house is in the direct line. You're going to get hit, and get out of your house while you still can. Within a few hours, you're not going to be able to get, I'm afraid you won't be able to get, get, get over the bridge. And so I said, okay. So we got in the car, <clears throat> Monday night, September 17th. We're driving away from our, our little place. We have COVID, both of us. We're driving away from our place. The water's already rising up. As we're, as we're driving out, we get over the bridge, and the city manager had told the pastor this. She said, now tell Pastor Tomlinson that we have 10 hotel rooms that we've, we've reserved 
there in Gulf Breeze at the, at the uh, uh, Hampton Inn. And she, she said, he said, she said, he, she said, tell pastor to call the, to call them and, or to go there, go to the Hampton Inn and tell them that, that I sent him, I sent them and to give him one of those 10 rooms that the city of Gulf Breeze has reserved for themselves. And you stay out, you ride out the storm there. So we did. But I, I thought, you know, I better call him. So I called him on the phone and I said, you know, I told him who I was told him who she was, Samantha. She's got those 10 rooms from, from city manager of Gulf Breeze. And, uh, and, and she said, I could have one of those rooms. They said, okay, that'd be fine. And then I said, now I need to tell you something before I, before I get there. I'm about three minutes away from you. And I said, I need to tell you, my wife and I both tested positive for COVID 12 days ago on September 6th. She said, sir, don't come to this hotel. We're not letting you in. You cannot come here. I said, okay, well, that's why I want, I want to call you to make sure that there wasn't going to be an issue when I got there. And I said, now, uh, where do you suggest I go? She said, there, there's nowhere for you to go. She said, they won't take you in any hotel. I said, how about the, how about the shelters that are set up for COVID-19? She said, they won't let you in the shelters. There's nowhere for you to go. That was September 18th. September 19th? Uh, the sun came up. God still loved me. Everything was okay. And it had nothing to do with me. Right? <laughs> None of that stuff. COVID wasn't God's judgment on me and my wife. The, uh, the shutdowns, the buying, the buying the town home that we thought we'd be there for 10 days and then finding out we were stuck for, I said, we we're okay with being stuck there. You know, you've got to be stuck somewhere. Florida's a good place to be stuck. None of that stuff had anything to do with us. I mean, we weren't saying, God, why did you let this happen to me? <laughs> what? It had nothing to do with me. I, got, I, got, I understood that. I wasn't thinking God was mad at me. I wasn't thinking something, you know, well, well you know, I read my Bible, I tithe, I preach, I, I, try, I try, I'm trying to do the best. I, no, no, look, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm not trying to minimize your problems. I'm not trying to minimize your crisis. I'm just trying to tell you, don't take everything personally. Don't feel like every problem that comes into your life is because, you know, you're getting a bad, bad. You said, well, what was going on? It's called living on planet Earth. We live on planet Earth. Hurricanes are going to come. Problems are going to come. Financial crises are going to come. People are going to let us down. I mean, it's, it's, my friend, it's just part of life. What I'm trying to say to you is don't lose hope when you find yourself in one of those crises. And by the way, we, 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 we survived. We, we found a, I had a preacher friend, you know, that was in another city and I called him on the phone at his home and I said, and by this time it's getting dark and the wind's blowing and the rains are there. And I said, hey preacher, do you, is anybody staying in that little, that little room that you've got at your church over there? And he said, no, no, I left it open in case anybody needed it. I said, well, can, can I use it tonight and tomorrow night and for the next week or two? And so he said, yeah, yeah, you can use it. And he gave me the code, and we waited our way, way over that city. And by the time we got there, I mean, the, it, it was getting pretty hairy with the rain. And um, pretty hairy means it's, it's an old English term that means it's really scary. <clears throat> and we got inside. We, we put the code in. We got inside that little room. And we'd been there before. I knew where it was. We got inside that little room, and uh, there's no food. There no, no places are open. I mean, we get inside that little room. We're both, I'm 70 years old. She's <clears throat> years old, and we both have COVID. <laughs> and we got in there. I, I'm not making this up. We, <laughs> we get in that room that night. It's pretty late by this time. The rain, the rain is blowing. The wind is blowing, and it's, it's, it's getting scary. We get inside that room. We, 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 we start looking around because this little missions department, sometimes they have like food in there. This time, of course, there's nothing, nothing. And so we, we get inside there. We said, well, let's go to bed. We got lights. We got water, running water. We got in bed. I am not making this up. We got in bed. My wife laid down on her side of the bed. I laid down on my side of the bed and it fell to the ground. <laughs> It's going like this. I'm laying on the ground. She's laying up here about a couple of feet. And I said, I said, welcome to Florida, sweetheart. 
We tried to fix the bed, couldn't get it fixed, so we finally just took it off and laid it on the ground, and, and we slept there for the next week or so until we could finally, finally get back home. Hey, it had nothing to do with me. God wasn't mad at me. God wasn't, God wasn't saying, you know, Dwight, you, you know, you just, you've been out of line here for a while. I'm, take that, buddy. How you like that? No, no, that's not what's going on. It's called, we live in a sin-cursed world. Don't take it personally. Don't look for somebody to blame. I'm going to tell you, I've got to move on with this, but Pastor, how many times have we seen this? You, 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 your children disappoint you. Don't blame, the, don't blame the youth director. Don't blame the pastor. Don't blame the church. Look, I don't know of anybody whose kids don't disappoint them at one time or another. Our, our, kids, our kids are sinners. They make mistakes. They're like us. They're like us. Don't take it personally, number one. When you get into crisis, don't take it personally. Number two, lay your fears and your needs before God in prayer. King Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, sends a messenger with a letter to Hezekiah. And in this letter he says, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to destroy all your people. You, you, there's no way you're going to live. Verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter. So Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, sends this letter by a messenger uh, to, to Hezekiah. So he gets the letter. He read it. Here's what he did. He went up into the house of the Lord. He spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel. He showed him the letter and he said, God, would you help us? What should we do in our crisis? Number one, don't take it personal. Number two, pray. Pray. Lay it before the Lord. Take your problems and your crisis before God. Hezekiah goes to the only one who has the power to help him. There is nobody in the kingdom that, that can stop this siege. Only God. It's his only hope. Why don't we do the same? Why don't we do the same? Rather than, rather than running to everybody else or, 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 or throwing up our hands in despair, or why don't we just bring it to God? Amen. The same God that was listening to Hezekiah is listening to us. Amen. That same God loves you, and he wants us to cry to him. Amen. That same loving God is waiting to hear from you. God was aware of what was going on. He, he knew about Hezekiah's fears. This wasn't a surprise to God. God didn't, when God didn't look down and say, hey, 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 Hezekiah, what, Hezekiah, what's going on, man? Oh, I got this. Oh, wow. When did that happen? No, God knew. And God knows your problems as well. He knows what's going on in your life. Um, God's response to Sennacherib's letter, Sennacherib now, the king of Assyria, sends this letter. You'll forgive me for this, but I'm, 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 I'm a little twisted up. I know. I understand. You know, those, you, know, you know those old, those old guys that run around with a hat on that says Vietnam vet, you know? They're walking around. They got the old, their shirts and that kind of stuff or their jackets or their hat, you know, and they're just kind of walking around and they're come, half of them have ponytails, you know? <laughs> they're old guys with ponytails walking around that says Vietnam vet, you know? They're a little off. I spent two tours in Vietnam with 75th Rangers. I just don't have the ponytail, you know? Just, <laughs> I... <laughs> I tried, but just wouldn't, I couldn't get into churches with it. You know, that's the best I could do. <laughs> I said, I keep telling my wife, honey, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me grow a ponytail and get me a hat. She said, no, 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 you just, just, just you're okay. <laughs> we'll starve to death if you <laughs> grow a ponytail, baby. <laughs> but you know, those guys are a little off, and, and so forgive me for this, what I'm about to show you, but preacher, I just, you got to understand, I'm, I'm just, I'm a little off. It's not my fault. <laughs> it's the army's fault. <laughs> um, I, I lo- I'm going to show you a verse. I love, I love God's response to Sennacherib. Sennacherib sends this letter to Hezekiah and says, you're going to die. I'm going to get you. And then Hezekiah, is, he, he's afraid, he's scared. He sends, this, he, he sends this message to, to Isaiah, says, what are we going to do? And would you pray for me? I'm praying. Would you pray too? Isaiah sends a message back and says to, to Hezekiah, 
This is what God said. This is what I want you to tell Sennacherib. Okay? Here's what God says to Sennacherib. Verse 27. I know thy abode. Hey, Sennacherib, I know where you live. (laughs) I don't know why I love that. (laughs) Sennacherib, you want to mess with me? I know where you live, buddy. I know what you did last summer. I know what you did last night. I know where you shop. I know where you live. I know what kind of car you drive. I know where you go. You can run, but you can't hide because I'm watching you and I'm coming. I love that. Verse 27, God says, I know thy abode. I know thy going out, thy coming in, and thy rage against me. And because thy rage against me and thy tumult has come into my ears, therefore I put my hook in your nose, my bridle in your lips. I will turn you back by the way which you came. And he did. God took care of him. Lay your petitions before God. Don't succumb to fear. Courage is not the absence of fear. We all, we all have fear. Courage is the ability to carry on in spite of your fear. When you're in that crisis and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're fearful and you're having panic attacks and you can't sleep at night and you're thinking, man, I don't know how to fix this. By the grace of God, pray, don't succumb to that fear. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Those panic attacks are not coming from God. They're coming from our own personal fears, from our, from our, from our sinful nature. They're coming from the devil. They're coming from our human nature. Our panic attacks are not from God. Don't make every problem about you. Take your problems to the Lord in prayer. And then number three, we'll wrap, we'll wrap it up. Trust your heavenly Father to settle your crisis however he sees fit. I tell you, in 49 years of marriage, almost 50, we've been through some crises. And sometimes God settled them the way we wanted, and sometimes he didn't. But ultimately, it was okay. It was okay. It's going to be okay in yours as well. God may or may not settle it the way you want him to, but he has promised, I will settle it in a way that's good for you, that brings ultimately is for your good and for my glory. Look at verse 17 again. So, well, let's go back up to verse 15. Isaiah's praying. He lays that letter from Sennacherib before the Lord. And, he, and, 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 and here's another thing you see in verse 15. When Hezekiah prays, he said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art, thy, that thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kings of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, that, open Lord, thine eyes and see and hear the words which Sennacherib, which has sent him to reproach the living God. Look, look at what he said in this letter, God. And you know what he said in verse 17? Hezekiah said, God, he's telling the truth. Sennacherib's telling the truth. When he said, I have no hope. I cannot stand before him. He's, he's telling the truth. I can't. I can't fix this. Verse 17, of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands. Sennacherib sent Hezekiah a letter. and He said, hey, I've been taking down countries and nations all around you. I took down your, your sister kingdom here of Israel. And you're, and, and, and you're next. I'm coming for you now. And none of the other nations have been able to stand before me. I'm going to get you too. And when Isaiah prays, he says, he says Lord, it, it, it's true. I'm sorry, Hezekiah prays. He says, Lord, it's true. He has taken those other nations. But um, he cast their gods into the fire. But God, they weren't real gods. See in verse 18, they were work of men's hands. They were wood and stone. Therefore, they've destroyed them. But God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kings of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. And so Hezekiah is saying, God, 
It's true that Sennacherib cannot be stopped. We, we don't have the power. But God, you do. Amen. And would you please, whatever you're going to do, would you save us? But would you do it so, people would, so you would receive the glory? Amen. And I think that's how we need to pray as well. Amen. Lord, I'm asking that you'd fix this crisis in my life. But God, you know what's best. Sometimes we're praying for somebody that they would be healed. And God may, may, may decide to give them ultimate healing, right? My mom and dad have both gone on to be with the Lord. I have other family members who've gone on to be with Jesus. The, 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 the prayer didn't, the crisis didn't get fixed the way I wanted it, but it got fixed the way it should be fixed. He knows what's best for his honor and glory. Listen to these verses and I'll, and I'll stop. Romans 8, 18, Paul said, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible goes on in verse 28, Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Not everything is good, but everything is going to work together for good even the bad things that come into our life. Who shall say, what shall we say to these things when we're thinking about these sufferings and these crises and these problems? Paul said, what should we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, if God is on our side and if God has promised all things are going to work together for good, then, then we have to trust that, that he knows what's right and it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Verses 37 to 39, they and all these things were more than conquerors to him that loved us. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's going to be okay. Number one, don't take it personal. God's not punishing you. He's not mad at you necessarily. I mean, there are times when God punishes us. I get it. I understand. But not every problem that comes into your life is punishment. Don't take it personal. Pray. Lay your problems and your crisis before the Lord and say, God, I I need help with this. And then trust him to fix it or settle it or bring it out the way he wants it done. Not necessarily the way you want it done. Perhaps we would be good, it would be good for us to go back and remember and, eat, and, and, and maybe not, not only remember but maybe believe this old song that we so often sing, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. You know, the older I get, the more I realize this world really isn't my home. I mean, so many friends have gone on. I, I, I preached for a young preacher the other day, and, and uh, the other day, when you get to my, my, be my age, you say the other day, and it was seven years ago, you know. <laughs> I was preaching for a guy a couple years ago, the other day, a couple years ago, and he said, uh, he said, Pastor Thomas, where can I find more men like you? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, old guys that have a good spirit, that aren't, that aren't mad, <laughs> aren't angry. And he said, you know, older men that, that he, said, he said, mostly older men are just, they're just mad. <laughs> they're angry. <laughs> and I said, I said, I said, well, there's, a, I said oh, there's a lot of guys, like, there's a lot of guys my age that aren't, that aren't angry. They aren't, they, they, they don't, we don't hate young preachers. You know? <laughs> we, we, we love you. We want to see you succeed. There's a lot of guys my age. Then later, we're in the car driving away, and I told my wife, I can't think of anybody my age who's still preaching. <laughs> Except maybe Don Sisk, you know, I mean, that's. Very few. Um, This world is not my home. I'm passing through, and so are you. Don't don't get too wrapped up in what happens here. Now, I'm I'm done, but maybe you're here tonight, and you're skeptical of what I'm saying. Maybe you're here tonight, and you're saying, you know, Dwight, I, I, uh, I I don't believe that stuff. It's nothing personal. I just don't believe it. 
I don't believe there's really a God in heaven who loves me, who cares about my future, who cares about what's going on in my life, and that this God, this loving God up in heaven somewhere, is orchestrating everything in my life for my good and his glory. I just, I don't, I don't believe that. Well, could I say this to you? <clears throat> uh, I get it. I understand. I understand that you don't believe it. I, you know why I understand it? I didn't believe it. I didn't get saved when I was 20 years old. I, I wasn't raised in, home, in a Christian home. I, I didn't get saved when I was 20. I dropped out of high school at 16, joined the Army at 17, went to Vietnam at 18, came back at 19, went back again to Vietnam for a second time, came back at the age of 20 and got saved. So when I, up until I was 20 years old, I didn't believe that there was a God in heaven that loved me, that everything was under his control. He was orchestrating things, that he would take even the bad things in my life, he would cause them to come out for, ultimately for my good, for his glory. I didn't believe that. So if you're here tonight and you don't believe it, I understand that you don't. But I would just say this to you. Don't you wish you did believe that? I mean, don't you wish you did? You might say, I don't believe that. But, 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 but in your heart, don't you wish you did believe that? Could I say to you, after 50 years now of, 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 of having met God and knowing that that's true, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go back for anything to not believing. You could... You could receive Christ as your Savior tonight. Tonight, right where you are, right there in your chair, if you're here tonight and you say, I'd like to believe that there's a God who loves me. I, I, I'm struggling with it. Why don't you just, in a moment, we bow our heads together for prayer. Why don't you just pray right where you are? And why don't you just say, dear God, would you come into my heart and would you show me that you're real? I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe he was buried. I believe he rose again the third day. Dear God, I need help. I need you. I can't face my problems alone. Would you come into my life? I give you my life tonight. You know what Jesus said? Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He promised. No one has ever come to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. I believe you died for me. I know I'm a sinner. Would you please come into my heart and, and, and save me? Nobody has ever done that and had Jesus say, no, not you. Yeah, he, he said he will no wise cast you out. You could meet him tonight. And if you're here tonight, you already know Christ is your Savior. Maybe you're saying, I've got problems. I've got a crisis. I understand. I do too. I do too. But I know in my crisis, there's only one person who can help me. I can yell, scream, cry. And I don't feel like doing some of that sometimes. I can gripe, I can complain, I can blame. Ultimately, nobody can fix this crisis except God. Why don't you just bring it before God and say, God, I don't want to play the blame game. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to do this stuff. I just want to ask you, would you fix this problem in my life? And Lord, I'm going to trust you that it's going to be okay no matter how it comes out because you're in control. Amen. Our Father, we do thank you tonight for your love for us. We thank you for the opportunity and privilege of being able to be here with these dear people. I pray, God, that you'd uh, take these simple words and thoughts and ideas, apply them to our hearts. Lord, maybe there's somebody here tonight without Christ. I pray, God, that tonight would be the night that they would just simply cry out to you and say, dear God, I, I don't want to be lost anymore. I don't want to go through life on my own. I, I want you to come into my heart and be my Savior. I give you my life. Or maybe there's somebody here like that tonight. Father, I would say definitely, for sure, there's many people here tonight that have a problem, have a crisis. God, I pray you'd help them tonight. Help them know how much you love them. Help them to stop blaming. Stop looking for blaming themselves or their, their, their mate or their pastor or their job or whatever, Lord. Help them, Father, to realize that they live in a world that problems come, and, they, and help them to lay those problems before you tonight. And God, may each of us lay our crisis before thee and then trust that whatever happens, you're in control, and you promised all things work together for good to those that love you. And so, Father, we love you tonight, and we're going to trust that these problems are going to work out for your honor and glory and for our good. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. 
I turn it over to Pastor.